Ask yourself, where am I missing it? Yeah. This promise of joy unspeakable, peace that passes understanding, is found in the gospel of grace. You need to find out what the gospel of grace is all about. It's not about you, it's all about Him. It's not about doing, it's about He's done it, D-O-N-E. It's not about striving, it's about resting. It's about praying. It's not about praying for victory or praying for healing. It's about praying out of victory. We were chatting a little bit off camera about kind of where we want to go with this. And I think it's crucial to lay a foundation of what you mean mm -hmm. when you say the gospel of grace. Because there's some kind of crazy stuff going on out there too. <laughs> yes, yes, there is. And uh, unfortunately, you know, every time um, God restores the truth, and it's a restoration, uh, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to be you know, really concerned if I'm getting all these things and out of the blue from nowhere, you know, I'm being deceived, you know, but it's nothing more than God restoring the gospel back to the church. Right. The same gospel that uh, God restored back to the reformers during the time of Martin Luther, mm -hmm. justification mm -hmm. by faith, yeah. right? And then God started restoring the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. You know, God started restoring the truths of the body of Christ, you know, the truths of, of the importance of the place of Israel, you know. Uh, all that truth is being restored. And finally, we are seeing God restoring the fullness of the gospel, what the gospel is all about. Because the world out there, they're not hearing the gospel. No, they're not. And, and, and if you shove a, a microphone under anyone in, in Main Street and you ask them, how would you, if I ask you a question, if there's a heaven all right, and a hell to shun, uh, what, 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 what qualifies you for heaven, all right? You probably hear a lot of works based. Well, you know, I, I, I don't blow people up. I don't blow buildings up. You know, I, I take care of my own family. I, I go to work every day. I, I don't mess with people's life. It's always based on works. I'm a good guy. Nobody was saved by the blood of Jesus. No, no, no. Nobody was saved except for believers, you know? Yeah. So what are they hearing? What do they know about, about God? And it's, you know, it's always works. So I think God is restoring the gospel of grace. Yeah. And grace is defined as, in Ro Romans 11 verse 6, is defined as uh, unmerited favor. You know, what, what Paul says, if it's by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it's of works, it's no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more gra uh, works. So it's antithesis, all yeah. right? But once you experience unmerited favor, and you can only experience that when you are most undeserving, okay? It causes you to respond. It's like, uh, we love because He first loved us, yeah. right? Um, but you need to experience that love of, 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 of the Father. And what we are hearing most of the time is still Old Testament preaching. Yeah. You gotta love God, you gotta love God, you gotta yeah. love God. And the greatest of all the commandments is you shall love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Yeah. And given that is the, Jesus himself said, is the greatest of all the commandments. But has anyone done that? Yeah, no. Not, even David, a man of the God's heart, failed. Failed in a big way, right? There's only one person who did that. It's our Lord Jesus, <laughs> right? So it's almost like God put man under law for 1,500 years and God says, okay, you try. You, you yeah. presume on your own strength, you, you, you go for it. Okay, yeah. love me with all your heart. The greatest of all commandments, the greatest of all the law is love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Yeah. No one could do it. No. And after that, God says, now watch me. After 1,500 years, God says, I'm gonna love you with all my heart. And he stretched his hands on the cross yeah. and gave his life for us. And today, Beautiful. we love because he first loved us. Yes. Right? But, but sometimes, you know, we, if we, we're not careful, the emphasis again back, you gotta love God more, you gotta love God more. It's and back people, to us. It's back, back to us again. You know, as, as opposed to unpacking the love of God for, for the people. Beautiful. And that takes the Holy Spirit to elucidate that. It's like in the Old Testament, every promise had an if. Yeah. Every one. That's right. And then when Jesus died on the cross, mm -hmm. and He became sin, and He died for us, mm -hmm. when, for, it's, it's like every if was removed. Yes. And now all, all fulfilled. The, yeah, all fulfilled. Yeah. Now all the promises are in Him. Right. And they're all yes and amen. Yes. Like it's, it's like it boggles your mind. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is that like we, we, we tell people they can be healed, they can be blessed, you know, they can, they can walk, operate under God's favor and all that. But I think deep down people want to know, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, I want to believe that. I want to believe that, but uh, I don't have a foundation. Mm -hmm. Because I know I have sin in my life. Why would God yeah. want to favor me? Why would God want to bless me? I have. I know. I know myself. You know, yeah. it's like for example, uh, if I were to tell you, Leon, you know, you, you one day you are just pressing in the buttons for your ATM, right? You call it ATM here. Um, yeah. Automated teller machine, right? To get your money, your cash out, 
and all of a sudden you saw your, your available balance is five million. <laughs> and you, let's say you don't have five million. <laughs> okay. right, I'll assume you don't have five million. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Uh, let's say you <laughs> have five. That'd be nice. That'd be nice though. <laughs> and you see that your balance is five million. Now how in the world did you get there? Your first response will be you were jumping up and you know, you'll tell Sally, yeah. you know what? We are millionaires. Look at that, man. Look at that. Look at that. You know, uh, you'll rejoice for about five minutes, only for about five minutes, and then you stop. Reality sets in. Wait a minute. How did it get there? Yeah. You want to know before you can rejoice with with unabated joy. Okay. Yeah. You need to know how it got there. Could it be a mistake of a teller or something like that? And then you check out the bank. The bank said, "No mistake, Mr. Fontaine. All right. This was uh, according to our records last month." somebody who want to remain anonymous gave you this amount, checked it into your account. Now <laughs> your joy is unimpeded. Now you, you, yeah. you have the reason for it. You have the reason for it. So yeah. I think when we share about grace, you know, grace gives people the reason why they, they can believe that God loves them. The, the cross, we talk about how Jesus paid the price, you know, how God cannot, and I say that with reverence, God cannot condemn us today. No. Those who believe on Jesus, yeah. because He's condemned His Son for our sins. Yeah. All right? And once God has condemned His Son, He cannot condemn us. He'll be yeah. unjust. And yeah. God designed it to be so. So we now have a foundation for yes. our joy, our peace. So true. You know, one of the things that really blessed me was, is the word born again begin to mean more to me, because I'd heard it my whole life, raised in a pastor's home. But when I recognize that whatever you are born, that's your nature. So dogs have puppies, cats have mm. kitties, cows have calves. It's the nature of a dog, it's the nature mm. of a cow. And so when we are born again. One of God. We're one of God's. Mm -hmm. And I was, like, I've got five kids and, and we were talking a little bit about it. When they were born uh, to Sal, Sally had them, but I mean, they're mine and hers. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they were not like really thankful or good for the first few years. They kept mm -hmm. us up all night. They threw up, they messed yeah. their pants. Uh, they never said, thank you, dad, for cleaning mm -hmm. my diapers. They, they, none of that. They just- It's the they same were... problem in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> but yet I would have given my life yes. for that little bond. And today still, with all my kids that are grown up, there is nothing I wouldn't do for them. I'm mm -hmm. so in love with them. And yet it's not, a, it's not even a thimble full yeah. of how much God loves them. Yes. And it just made me realize his grace that I am born Mm. into his family, and he just couldn't do enough for me. Mm, mm, he loves mm, me mm. so much. And I think when people understand that this, this gospel of grace, this message of grace, and they, mm. they begin to sense how loved they are. Right. You know, and you speak on that so well. I heard a message mm -hmm. you were talking about where mm -hmm. you said, stop worrying. In fact, mm -hmm. tell us about that. Do we need to worry about loving God, loving God? You gotta love God more because mm -hmm. that's how I was raised. Love God more. You gotta love him. And you're saying, yeah, well, just yeah. a minute. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I used to wonder, for example, uh, in, in the Gospel of John, all right? John would address himself <laughs> five times as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. You know, and I've heard preachers saying that uh, uh, of all the disciples, Jesus loved John especially. Right. Oh, I've heard that, that could not be uh, the thing because he loves us all the us same. All. all right. But but why did John say that disciple whom Jesus loved? It's the same thing. Like if I if I uh, like yesterday we had we had uh, dinner with uh, Pastor Joe, right? And you were there. So if I, if I write in a diary tonight, last night we had pa uh, Pastor Joe there, all right? Uh, Pastor Lawrence, Pastor Leon. And the pastor whom Jesus loved, Pastor Darren and, pastor, and the pastor whom Jesus loved. <laughs> you know, what am I saying? I'm practicing yeah. his love for me. Yeah. All right? He loves you all the same, but I'm, I'm practicing it. Now, on that last supper that night, there was another apostle, there was another disciple who boasted of his love for the Lord. And there was Peter. His name means stone. He represents the law. He says, if all this, he pointed to all the, he had, he had the gumption to point to all the disciples and say, if all this forsake you, I will never, not me. And, and not me. And where you go, I'll follow, I'll die for you. Yeah. And Jesus says, before the rooster crows this morning, you will deny knowing me three times. He said, no way, right? He, now he represents believers that boast of their love for the Lord. Yeah. Whereas John, being the youngest also, he was on the right side of Jesus and he leaned back because the Israeli way of eating in those days would be to recline as they mm -hmm. eat. And he leaned back on Jesus' bosom. Mm -hmm. By his gesture, he's expressing, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Yeah. I'm not depending on my love for him. I'm depending on his love for me. 
he leaned back on the Lord's bosom. All right? So he's saying, in essence, I am the one whom Jesus loved. Peter is saying, by the way, John's name means grace. Yohanan, God's grace. Wow. Right? And Peter means stone. So Peter says, I am the, the one who loves the Lord. John <laughs> says, I am the one the Lord loves. For love. Before the, day, the night was over and, and morning came, where was the disciple that uh, boasts of uh, his love for the Lord? Weeping tears of, uh, of, of sorrow. Yeah. Having denied the Lord three times. He didn't mean to. He really meant to love the Lord, but he ended up in failure. All right? And shame. Where was the disciple that boasts of the Lord's love for him? He is the only one at the foot of the cross. Wow. And Jesus, he, he was of use to the Lord. The Lord could say, take care of my mother. Yeah. John, take care of my mother. And uh, um, he was also the first one to recognize uh, two weeks after Jesus rose from the dead by the shores of Galilee. And the Lord walked by the shore and said, have you caught any food? He says, uh, we have toyed all night, we caught nothing. Throw your net on the right side and they found the abundance of fish. The Bible says, the disciple, it doesn't say John, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved said, it is the Lord. When you, when you trust in His love for you, it makes you a quick perception. Yeah. All right? it, it makes you a spiritual employment at the foot of the cross. Beautiful. All right? Whereas the one that boasts of His love, he ended up as, as a failure. It's a failure. So I think that that, that illustrates the truth that in, under, the, under law, you love God all your heart, all your soul. <laughs> but no one could do that. No. But under grace, God loves us all. So our focus needs to be on focusing on His love for His me. His love for me. Yeah. And I, I would say like this, those who are loved best, love best. Yes. Right? Those who know that they are loved, they will love. And, and there's no hymn there in the original. Uh, it says we love because He first loved us. First loved us. All right? We love Him and we love one another. We yep. love our family because He first loved us. Wow. And that's where it's missing. The message, yeah. uh, yes. uh, you know, is it, it's, it's unclear, you know, yeah. it is still ambiguous, you know, it's not about, yeah, you, you, you know, but you got to love God. You should prove your love. And people are, you know, I, I was a youth pastor many years ago and I would preach like that. You got to love God. Yeah. You got to love yeah. God. And all the while, <laughs> while I'm preaching that in my heart, I'm saying, how do I love him? <laughs> I don't really love him in a wild way, but, but boy, I, I love him. I do love him now and more I see his love. More than ever. You know, what's interesting about the thought you just made is that psychologists and Christian psychologists tell us that where someone gets their sense of significance, mm. their sense of importance, their sense of value yes. is really determines uh, their quality of life. So if mm. I get my sense of significance and value from my job, that will be my focus. If I get my sense or significance from my looks, mm. I got a problem because gravity happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And But if I get my significance from how loved I am, Mm -hmm. It's the most secure that a person's ego or persona could yes. ever be. Yes. Is, rec is God loves me, and mm -hmm. that's what gives me value. Then everything else Very I just good. do for the sake of, of for God. And, and that, 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 that is true humility. Yeah. You know, we talk about pride and humility in the body of Christ and how it's defined. You know, the Bible says that Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the most humble act, you know, you can do. But notice how he says it before he says he washes their feet, he says that Jesus, in John, he says Jesus knowing he was going to the Father, knowing that he came from the Father, knowing that he has all things given to him in his hands, stooped down and washed their feet. Wow. So it takes a secure person to be humble. Yeah. I always say uh, the proud people, they are proud because they are insecure. Yeah, it's you true. And, and one of the biggest problems we have uh, today uh, it, it's leadership that's insecure. Yes, I agree. You know, if we are secure, we will serve. We have a saying that people who act superior feel inferior. Yeah. And so they put all this on. Mm -hmm. And I love what you just said. It's so true that if you are so secure because you're the one Jesus loves. That's how you feel yeah, and yeah. believe. It doesn't really matter. You may love me. I'd like for you to love me. But hey, yeah. it doesn't matter. He it loves me. Matter. Israel said to God at the foot of Mount Sinai, Okay, thus far, no laws were given. When God brought them out of uh, uh, Egypt, no laws were given, all right? When God brought them to the Red Sea, no laws were given. But at the foot of Mount Sinai, they boasted. In a sense, it was a boast. Even in the Hebrew, it says, Kol asher dibir Adonai na'ase. Na'ase is a very affirmative word, saying that all that you can command us, they have not heard it yet, but all that you can command us, we can do it. Ooh. 
we can do it. Now that's presuming on their strength, which they had none. You see, God changed his tone. If you read carefully, that's Exodus 19 that mm -hmm. I just quoted from. Exodus 20, God gave the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. But Exodus 19, God changed his tone like this. God said to Moses, Moses, tell them, don't come near. That was never his tone when he brought them out to the Red Sea. No. Uh, the bitter waters of Marah, God sweetened the bitter waters. He never had miracle that Miracle after miracle. Miracle. Pillar of cloud by day, yeah. the pillar of fire by yeah. night, from Egypt all the way. But Mount Sinai, God changed his tone immediately. The moment man presumed on his strength. Wow. In, in essence, they are saying, God, we know you, you are blessing us based on the covenant of grace with Abraham, our father, which we don't deserve. You know? yep. So it's undeserved favor. You opened the Red Sea because of undeserved favor. You delivered us out of <laughs> undeserved favor. You sweetened the bitter waters of Mara uh, and manna and all that because of your favor. But God, from now on, bless us based on our goodness. Oh boy. Bless us based on our obedience. Yeah. Bless us based on how faithful we are. We know you blessed us because you were faithful. We know you are faithful to the covenant of Abraham. We know that you bless us because you know, uh, um, uh, of grace. But now just bless us. Pride. Pride. The moment they did that, God says, you want me to bless you, assess you based on your performance? All right? Don't come near me lest you die. He never spoke like that. Wow. Moses tell them, don't come near lest they die. Even if an animal touched the mountain, it will die. Okay, then, next chapter. This is the big ten. Keep all ten. And if you break one, you, you're not guilty of the one you break. You're guilty of all. James says, you break one law, you're guilty of all. And the stories after that went south quick. Yep. It was the brutal. The moment they sinned, same sin. Ugh. When they crossed the Red Sea, they murmured. Yep. When they at the widow waters of Marah, they murmured. No one died. Murmuring is sin, but no one died. That's right. But after that, they murmured, they dropped dead. Dropped dead. When they complained, they dropped dead. So now, which do you want to be under? <laughs> the law or under grace? <laughs> yeah. You know, and for 1,500 years, they were under, under law and and the lesson is not taught. So it's back to this uh, uh, walking after the flesh. Even today in Galatians for believers, right? Paul used the word, now the works of the flesh are variance, jealousies, uh, <laughs> hatred, witchcraft, adultery. He calls it the works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it's not works of the Spirit. No. Fruit. fruit What's the difference? Oh. Works is the result of effort. Yep. Fruit is the result of life. Yes. Now, for five chapters, he talked about law and grace in Galatians. Law and grace, he contrasts them, law and grace, law and grace, because the Galatians were going back to the law. Okay? In chapter 5, he says, now, if you are under law, these are the works you have produced. If you are under grace, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Even self-control is a fruit. Yeah. Think about it. That's incredible. If, if, I, if, I, if I'm preaching to my young people, all right, in, in the youth ministry, I, 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 let's say I want self-control in them. What do I do in the natural human logic? I'll preach self-control. Right. It's like putting wood on fire. <laughs> but actually, if I want self-control, what do I do? I preach grace. And grace, the fruit of that is self-control. Yeah. Love, joy, peace. And yet in the body of Christ, there are so many that they, they just, what's the word? They, don't rec they keep seeing it as sexual issues when they ever talk about the flesh. Yeah. And they don't realize that in their own strength, they're trying mm -hmm. to serve God, just like we were talking right. about with Peter. Right. And for some reason, they don't understand that's pride. Yeah. Because we, they think pride is arrogance, where you mm -hmm. act like it and you're condescending. Mm -hmm. But pride, if you were to define pride, how would you define it? Exactly what I said just now, to trust in your own, own. efforts. Right, which, is, which a lot of people don't recognize that it's not a matter of being arrogant or being nope. loud. Nope. You can have the nicest, quietest, yeah. most, you know, sweet. You got full of pride. <laughs> wait, wait till uh, he's under the fire. I mean, you, you, you don't know, you know? Yeah. And, and people judge based on, you know, uh, what they see. But it, it's amazing that, uh, that grace, you know, we, what we are, we are saying is that we're not saying stop praying, no. stop fasting, no, stop no. reading the Bible. We're not saying that. But, but why are you doing them? Okay, why do I go to church? Hey, going to church is where I, I listen to all these truths, where mm -hmm. I get this kind of feeding. Okay, why, why do I pray? I pray because I'm close to God. Yeah. If, if, if I'm driving down the road and there's an accident on the road, hey, of all the people there, I'm the one with influence with God. Yeah. And I can pray and, and, and ask God to do something about that situation, to help the person, sure spare his life, get him safe. Yep. You know? uh, because I have influence with God. So it's a world of difference. It's like heaven and hell. Within praying for victory, 
are praying from victory. So as believers today, under grace, we pray from victory. Yes. So we, 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 we are saying, look at your, your motivations, all right, to, to determine whether you are under law and grace. I can't tell if somebody is under law or grace. I can't tell mm -hmm. because they are doing the very same things. But one person has joy, the other person doesn't. Where there is grace, there's always joy. There's always joy. They're, they can't be taken apart. Yep. Because it's, you know, a lot of people today, you know, they, they pray Old Testament style. Right. It's like begging God mm -hmm. for something, mm -hmm. bugging God enough. If I yeah. pray enough and rat, tat, 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 bombard heaven. heaven. <laughs> yeah, bombard heaven. Or I have to, in their mind, they have to intercede something through. They got to destroy yeah. satanic holds. They've got to. And mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and I understand, you know, prayer and stuff. But how would you help people understand old covenant prayer yeah. and new covenant? or the promises of God that are available. Let's unpack that a little bit because that's a huge issue in the body of Christ today. Yes, yes, and, and first of all, even the way we address God, it has changed. You know, in the Old Testament, they would address him as Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who brought the children of Israel out, you know, and they would pray the kind of prayer, right? Mm -hmm. They pray corporate prayers where they confess their sins as part of the, the process. Jeremiah did it, Daniel yep. did it, yep. uh, Nehemiah did it. But, but the thing is that in the New Testament prayer, Okay, there, there, there is a prayer, uh, what, what I call, during the time when Jesus was here, he taught them the Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. okay, and, and he taught them to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, which came on the day of Pentecost, all right? And he prayed that, uh, forgive uh, uh, our trespasses as we forgive, forgive those. Yep. Now, when Paul wrote Ephesians and Colossians, Paul said, forgive one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Now, Jesus Actually, if you read carefully, it says, forgive even as we forgive. In other words, if I don't forgive, don't forgive me. That's right. But Paul says, forgive, your motivation has changed. Forgive because even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Yeah. Now, people say, well, is Paul disputing Christ? No. Christ on earth and Christ who gave Paul from heaven, the ascended Christ, who gave the epistles to Paul yes. for the church. It's the same Christ. It's not Paul's words. It's, it's the words of Christ. That's right. There's a change yep. after the cross, okay? So the Lord, I, I believe you want to pray the Lord's Prayer. No problem in praying the Lord's Prayer. But why is it that on the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus says, up till now you have asked nothing in my name. But hasn't he taught them to pray the Lord's Prayer? I'm sure the disciples have been praying the Lord's Prayer every day, yep. ever since the Lord taught them. And yet, in the Last Supper, before he was crucified, right, he says to them, up till now you have asked nothing in my name. So the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer of asking in His name. Obviously, He's talking about a new kind of prayer. That's right. Right? He addressed the Father. All right? And, uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the spirit of, of Abba, Father, Sonship. No. You know? And, and there is that reverence. And, and, and yes. I, I'm all for reverencing God. You know, Amen. Like, like my, my, my daughter, my son, you know, when, when I'm in church and all that, they address me, you know. I mean, my son doesn't, but my daughter does. You know, she respects me. She knows who is around, that kind of thing. And there's a place when you worship God. There are times I worship God as God Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of, you know, because let's say your father is a judge. Your father is also your father. Your father is an author. Your father, how do you address him, right? So there are times of, of uh, you know, you need to address him in decorum, all right? Yeah. You know, we respect. And I do that in worship. I like to talk about him as the God of Almighty God, Amen. you know, the God of Abraham, Amen. you know, Jehovah. But actually the, the name that Jesus came to reveal is Father. <laughs> And that's my, my intimate name right. with, uh, with God. So my prayer becomes like, it's a family thing, you know, it's a family request, Father, you know, and it's all provided for. So that, that I think uh, there's been a change, even yes. in prayer. We yeah. are praying the Spirit, for example, uh, that they didn't have in the Old Testament. No. And that speaks of intimacy, of all the gifts. They had all the gifts you know, of the Spirit, but not the gift of praying in the gift of heavenly language, in, yes. of tongues. Why is it that, that uh, the body of Christ uh, don't see that, that it's a special gift they can yeah. pray without engaging your mind. Mm -hmm. Boy, we need that. Oh, uh, when 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 the women are, are, are doing the dishes uh, and when they are uh, when we are driving, when we are taking care of kids, you know, they're just they're doing life. You know, it's, it engages our mind. Does that mean we cannot pray? Yeah. But now there's a prayer. It's powerful. That is according to the will of God. You know, yeah. and it's a powerful prayer. You know, when you take a look at. Um what Jesus did on the cross, like Galatians 3.13 says, he became a curse for us. So therefore, right. there's no curse anymore mm -hmm. that has a right on us. Mm -hmm. 
and then the blessings yeah. that come on our life. So Peter talks, for example, about he's given us all things mm -hmm. that pertain to life and godliness. godliness yeah. To me, it's like in the Old Testament, there was always a, a beseeching and a waiting for God to move. Yeah. In the New Testament now, since the cross, mm -hmm. it's like God moved yeah. and he provided mm -hmm. and he's given it all to us. And so mm -hmm. as we pray, I love how you're saying that, that mm -hmm. we're not praying from a thing of, please God, God, I need yeah, you, yeah. please, please. It's like people must look at the church, yeah. especially if someone's new in church, right. and they watch how they worship, yeah. where it's, I'm trying to find yeah. God, or they watch how we pray, please, We are, we are reflecting a God who is distant. Yes. A God who's cold. Yeah. Who needs to be persuaded to yeah. give us the very things that we are beseeching Him for. That's exactly right. And so when we take a look at the promises of God for today, would you say that every promise in the Bible is now yours in Christ, yes, period? Yes, yes. Every one of them. For all the, I'm quoting scripture now, for all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, are yes, and in Him, amen. So there are those who say, well, this is for the Jews and all that, okay? But hey, all right, I agree. But then all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. I can claim any promise that I see in the Old Testament, okay, I can't claim those specifically for that person, but mm -hmm. I can claim it, you know, it's all mine, in so Christ. Me, so let me ask you a question. So pretend, kids pretend. So if some disease or sickness was to uh, push at your body or at one of your children's body, mm -hmm. praying, you wouldn't be going, God, if you could just in your goodness, please mm -hmm. do something about this. Yeah. That's not the way you'd pray. No. <laughs> okay, I'll how would you I'll, pray? Uh, well, um, I have something that uh, uh, we do uh, in our household, you know, um, and there's something that um, uh, God showed me from the scriptures. For this reason, right, many are weak and sick, and many fall asleep. So in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament, Paul Paul says there's one singular reason why the body of Christ are weak and sick and fall asleep. He didn't say reasons, plural. No. Singular reason. What is that? Not discerning the Lord's body. Right? And the Lord's Supper. And how we have misconstrued that into, oh. from something Eucharistic, Thanksgiving, celebratory, to something we are frightened of. Make a list of your sins. Yeah. And, and what, is, what is partaking in an unworthy way? When you come to Him and you feel condemned, you come to Him and you don't see that He has paid for your sins, you are demeaning the blood. Yeah. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness, for the remission of sins. And we take it with the consciousness of sins, not yeah. remitted. Yeah. We take the bread, and we, we don't even discern that his body was crushed, that our bodies will be healed. So we are, we are partaking unworthily. The way it's preached sometimes is like unworthy people cannot partake. Right. It's the manner, not the person. Mm -hmm. It's the adverb, and adverb there modifies your action. So uh, we need to, so we have the Lord's Supper at home, all right? We take the Lord's Supper and we just believe that with his stripes I am healed, and we release our faith, you know, at that moment. We just believe it's healed. And we do that, okay? That's, that's a New Testament way, yep. I, I believe. And, and of course, uh, uh, there's also a lot of factors when people ask why some are not healed, you know? Mm -hmm. I really think it's no longer the Old Testament curse of the law as if Jesus did not take care of it. Mm -hmm. I think the whole deal has got to do with condemnation. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I have a teaching called um, Condemnation Kills. And I got that from 2 Corinthians 3, where it says the, le uh, the, uh, the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. And it was contrasting old covenant and new covenant. All right? Um, you see, on the day of Pentecost, the first Pentecost, the Jewish people celebrated. Now, the first Passover was the night the angel of death passed through Egypt. The blood was on the doorpost. That's the very first Passover. 50 days from there, where do you find them? At the foot of Mount Sinai. That was the first Pentecost. You ask any Jewish person, they will tell mm -hmm. you, uh, they celebrate Pentecost of the giving of the law. We celebrate Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit. Right. And you read what happened at the foot mm. of the mountain. 3,000 people died. 3,000 people died when the law was given. Okay? Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, new covenant, right? No longer Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. God gave not the law, but the Spirit. How many were saved? 3,000 were saved. <laughs> so the letter yeah. kills. And the letter here is not letter of scripture, it's the letter of the law. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So I got to studying the letter that kills, and God says, and I began to read the chapter uh, uh, 3, 
of 2 Corinthians, and it talks about ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness. If the ministry of condemnation had glory, now, you know all the revivals of times past, some of the revivals, I don't, I don't want to mention the names, but, but it's based on sin. I mean, it's sin consciousness, yeah. right? And the revivals, and, and they had some glory. They had some glory. We can't deny that. But look at this verse. If the ministry of condemnation had glory, God didn't say the ministry of condemn, condemnation had no glory. Moses came down the mountain, his face was shining. But it was, it was not an ever-increasing splendor. It was diminishing. So he had to hide his face so that people will not see the fading glory, right? So the, the, that the ministry of condemnation had glory, but the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. <laughs> so we ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. We, we're not seeing the revival that yeah. comes when righteousness is being preached. And I, I, I think we are, we are coming into, the, in those, into those days. Agreed. No more sin consciousness, but, but really righteousness consciousness. We are glorifying Jesus. And when people feel condemned, I feel like... Uh, you know, that condemnation kills them slowly. It does. It does. Because the, I think there's intelligence in our body, and I preach this very often. Uh, I, I talk about uh, intelligence in our DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, all those who are suffering from autoimmune disorders, you know, is your, the, the doctors will say your body is fighting against itself. Mm -hmm. Your immune system is fighting against your own body. Yeah. And producing that disease. But actually, long before that happens, what happens is that you condemn yourself. You judge yourself. And your body responds by saying, hey guys, it's so intelligent, it says, hey guys, he wants to condemn himself. Let's produce something. Mm -hmm. All right? There's a sentence of judgment on, on us. Let's produce something. Okay? But the moment if you respond, you know grace, you look at the cross. Yes, I deserve to be smitten. Yes, but that's my smiting. Right. Yes, I deserve to be beaten, but that's my beating. Mm -hmm. Yes, I deserve to be judged and condemned, but that's my condemnation at the cross. Everything inside you goes... Shallow. That, that woman at the well, you know, uh, uh, she was, she was uh, timid, she was shy and, and she had every reason to because, you know, she was living with uh, five, I mean, she had five husbands and living in adultery and the Lord came and ministered to her, right? But when she left, look at that, she come see a man, she's no longer, yeah. she's bold. Yeah. She's an immediate evangelist. Yep. Come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Yeah. Just that moment with Jesus. So true. Where he, he changed, her, her focus became on him. <laughs> Right? Yep. And that delivered her from self. So when we are more occupied with Christ, it delivers us from self. You know, one of the things that really helped me was <laughs> believing for big things sometimes and seeking God about stuff. I realized the devil quotes scripture. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's... Well, Not when, fully, though. He doesn't... No, no, no. It. It's always twisted. Yeah, twisted. But, you know, the Bible says he comes as an angel of light. Yeah. And I've never actually talked to anybody in my travels that has had the devil come to them as an angel of light, mm. so maybe someone I haven't met. Mm -hmm. But when I look at that verse, it says, an angel of light is like an angel of, because the, the, thy word is a lamp unto my feet yeah. and a light unto my pathway. Mm -hmm. And I found that every time I would go to do something new that God had called me to, transitioning to a new area, reaching out with you know new organizations, mm -hmm. you know television, whatever we were believing God for, that stuff, the enemy would come against you and he would get mm -hmm. me focused on me and try to use the word. He'd twist it. Yeah. And I know a ton of people that until they get into God's word and begin to have an understanding of how grace, mm -hmm. because the same verses I see God's grace, they'll see law. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going, how did you get that from that? Yeah. And yet that, I think that we were talking on another show how that Paul, who was the most brilliantly trained guy of the time mm -hmm. in the law yeah. and in the Old Testament, the Mosaic and, and all mm -hmm. the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, he needed a good 14 years <laughs> yep. to just get into the Word and, and just begin to see as mm -hmm. Jesus revealed to him. And I'm not saying it's going to take 14 years other than um, when you begin to understand grace, it just sets right, you free. Right. Yes. And the devil loses his power. Because every time he condemns you, you just said it, his only goal is to get you think about you. You think about you. Yeah. You think about you. Yes. But if you can go back to Christ and what mm -hmm. he's done, the miracle's yours. Yes. The yes. miracle's yours. Yep. That is so true. Mm -hmm. When we talk about miracles and the miraculous, we, we, you and I were chatting about how that when we give our lives to Christ, mm -hmm. that we are like him. Old things pass away. Behold, 
everything becomes mm-hmm. new. And people sometimes get confused because within the first few weeks, if they haven't been taught the word and they mm-hmm. go back and they're still smoking, still drinking, still whatever, mm-hmm. that they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. But the spirit man is alive yeah. with Christ, correct? Yes. yes. And the Bible even talks about that as he is, yeah. so are we, so are we in, this in this world. So our spirit man is alive with mm-hmm. all we're ever going to need. Right. Yeah. And it is, I like the word it's sealed. I know I've been bringing that up lately, but mm-hmm. and it's sealed. It can't get contaminated, our nope. spirit man. Yeah. But now the mind that we have trained for 30, 40, 50 mm-hmm. years still is trained the way it is. Yes. And the body's yes. still got the same desires. Right. So when we, so when the devil attacks us, he'll always attack our performance. Yes. And we go back to Christ's performance. Yeah. Is that correct? As absolutely. Uh, that's the reason why we need to hear the word. All mm. right. And when I say the word, you know, hearing the law is also hearing the word, right? Because the Ten Commandments are from God. They are holy. They are holy, but they cannot make you holy. They are righteous, they cannot be righteous. So make sure that, that when you hear the word, it is the word of Christ, the revelatory word. You know when it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of yeah. God? The, the translation there is actually the word of Christ. Because the word of God is, the Ten Commandments is also the word of God. Right. But does it produce faith? No. Um, the word of Christ is a revelation of the word, what the word reveals about Christ. So even heathen, hidden in the Old Testament, all the types of, of Christ. When you bring it out, it now becomes the word of Christ. It becomes Beautiful. life to the people. So faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. All right? That's it's not huge. Just, not, 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 just, not just the word of God. No. Now, the thing about people is that uh, all of us are the same. We have this propensity towards legalism. All of us, yeah. myself included. And, and it's like inbred in us. You know? uh, we can hear 10 sermons every Sunday on grace, all right? What well, we are enjoying. Every Sunday, we, we are hearing 10 su- successive sermons on, on, on grace. But the 11th Sunday, someone comes in, has a mixture. Yeah. Nobody preaches pure law, you know, except in some synagogues, you know. Yeah. Unless, <laughs> but but they, pre- they preach a mixture yeah. of law and grace. You can actually forget all the 10 you've just heard. It's true. Just like that. Just like that. Martin Luther said it like this. Martin Luther says, uh, I preach to myself every day that I'm justified by faith. I preach to myself the gospel that I'm justified by faith every day. I preach to myself. They didn't have uh, CDs back then. No. Right? So I preach to myself every day because, because he said, every day I forget. That's so true. And that that, that puts the importance. I think the body of Christ don't value hearing, hearing, hearing. hearing. they, they, they buy a city, they keep it, all right? They don't realize that they're very fierce, the stress they're undergoing and all that. They can actually hear the stress away. Yeah. They can hear their way out of fears. They can hear, they put on your, your city and you talk about the goodness of God. You talk about how you can live a supernatural life, all right? Just by listening, all right? At the end of it, they, they, where's my stress? Where's my fear? Yeah. I, I feel good. I feel light. I feel free. That's where the body of Christ ought to be. I think yes. in these days, we ought to be listening day and night I agree. Put it in, in put a, 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 we got a cassette tape, but CDs or a whatever, CD and or, just listen to it. Yeah. On but, your MP3, keep on hearing, keep on I hearing. When I was younger, I would read the word, but all I could see was what I had to do. Mm, I mm. remember praying, and when I would go to pray. As opposed to revealing something to you, who right. you are. It, it was Christ. so, it, like, it was, and so I had to get free from it. And then I would go to pray, and as soon as I would pray, I thought it was the Holy Spirit. He would begin to show me all that I had done wrong that day, and mm. I didn't do enough this, and I, I, did, I spoke harshly to my wife, and I yeah, should have yeah, done this more yeah, and that yeah, more. Yeah. And so I didn't enjoy the Word, Mm-mm. and I didn't enjoy praying, mm-hmm. because both made me feel like I couldn't measure up. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until I understood the Gospel, the mm-hmm. good news mm-hmm. of the Gospel, that something in me completely clicked <laughs> You know, that Jesus did this for me, that yes. he qualifies me, yeah, that amen. righteousness is a gift. And, yeah. and when I begin to understand his grace, now I can't get enough of the word. Yeah. 
I'll just, I mean, I'll go to the most beautiful places on the planet preaching somewhere and just sit in my room and just read yeah. or grab a coffee shop and I just, I just can't get enough. And the more I read, the more at peace and the more happy mm, and the more yeah. loved I yeah. feel. And then when I pray, I recognize that's not even God, the Holy Spirit doing mm, that. He's mm, the one telling mm. me he loves me and he cares about me. Yeah, yeah. But if we don't make this switch from law mm, mm. to grace, the Bible can almost beat you up. Yes. Yes, and it's so subtle. And, and I, I love the way uh, I, I love to preach on the Emmaus road. You know, uh, when Jesus mm. rose from the dead, the very yeah. same day he rose from the dead, he appeared to two on the on on the Emmaus road, going back to Emmaus. And the Bible says they were sad; they were talking to each other. All right, and the Lord came close, but the Lord restrained their eyes from seeing him. Yeah. I used to wonder, Lord, why do you why do you restrain their eyes from seeing you? Isn't it cool that they see your nail yeah. pierced hands? Hey guys, I'm alive. Yeah, hey yeah. guys, come on. That's what you I would know? have done. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would have done that. Yeah, but I was thinking, why, why do you, but he answered me. He told me, uh, but before that, he says, uh, what happened guys? I mean, you are disappointed talking to each other. Oh, haven't you heard? Are you a stranger? All right, what happened this past few days? And then he starts telling me about Jesus and all that, how he died. We thought he's, he was, he's gonna rescue Israel. He's gonna save Israel. So their mind was still on Israel, not on Jesus. Jesus is a means to an end. Central to their focus is Israel. Yep. We, thought, we thought it was He who should redeem Israel. Right. Then He brought them to Him being the central focus. He says, Oh foolish and slow of heart to believe. Now would you agree, Leon, that in the body of Christ, we have these two major problems. <laughs> Slowness of heart to believe. <laughs> yeah. or, or if we, if we know, we, either we are ignorant, we don't know. We're in, or if we know, we are slow to believe what we know. What's the remedy? Beginning at Moses, the first five books, and the prophets, he began to expound things concerning himself. What a, what a Bible study trip it was, wow. the journey. First five books, he began to expound things, things concerning himself, not what to do. No. Later on, they said their hearts burn. Yep. Okay? At the end of the trip, at, 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 they invited him to the house, and he broke bread, he disappeared. He, they realized who he was, he disappeared. And then they said, didn't our hearts burn when he opened up the scriptures? Yeah. Right? Now, the thing is that how did Jesus remedy the problem of ignorance and slow to believe in the body of Christ? By expounding things concerning himself. himself. And from the Old Testament, mind you. Yeah. And then I understood, the Lord began to show me that the reason why he restrained their eyes is so that all of us will have hope for us today. Because if they had seen him with their physical eyes, we'll say that, of course, he appeared to them. But then he restrained them from seeing him in, in, in person, so that they can see Him in the Scriptures Beautiful. first. In that way, it gives us all equal opportunity. Yeah. We can see Him in the Scriptures every day. Yes. You know? So this thing about well said. seeing the Bible, what to do instead of seeing Him. Yes. And how are we transformed? By beholding what to do? No. We, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in the glass, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Yeah. From glory to glory, who does it? Our efforts? No, by the Spirit of the Lord. Yeah. So what we need to do as preachers by the grace of God is to unveil the glory of the Lord in our pulpit and step back and see the people transform Beautiful. by the Holy Spirit. Yes. But most of, us, most of our teaching is more like what to do, what to do, yeah. what to do. We are yeah. back to that. You know? Because it's easy to preach. It is. It's, it's seven steps, five steps, eight yeah. steps. It's easy to preach. Yeah, double anointing, this, that. <laughs> Man, our time is almost up here. We got two, believe that. two minutes left <laughs> yeah, already, like but... What a joy to sit and just talk about His grace. Mm -hmm. And if, if anyone's watching today and they're burdened and, and they find church hard and, and reading the Word and knowing God, then they really don't have a revelation of God's grace. No, they don't. Because yeah. your heart will burn within you. You will begin to laugh again. Yes. You'll be so filled with joy when you mm -hmm. see what He's mm -hmm. done. And you made a comment to me the other day. We were, we were visiting up a store, which I love doing, and you said, people don't understand the power of the blood. Yeah. And when you go to the cross, Paul kept talking about, he mm -hmm. took everyone to the cross, the cross, yes. the cross, the cross, because it's what Jesus did at the cross. It's, we just see it as a forgiveness of sins, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. Yeah. It's that new life and it's mm -hmm. his grace that, that flows in our lives. Mm -hmm. And with a minute remaining, what would you say to the folks as just a final thought about his grace in their life? I, first, I, I like to say also that we're not teaching people that there is no hell. Right. All right. We're not teaching people that uh, uh, everyone is safe automatically. Mm -hmm. right? Watch out for those pseudo grace teachings. Yes. And but really, to first ask yourself, 
are you experiencing the abundant life that God, God, God has uh, promised in His Word in John 10? Jesus says, I come that you might have life. If you don't, ask yourself, where am I missing it? Yeah. This promise of joy unspeakable, yeah. peace that passes understanding, is found in the gospel of grace. You need to find out what the gospel of grace is all about. It's not about you, it's all about Him. It's not about doing, it's about He's done it, D-O-N-E. It's not about striving, it's about resting. It's about praying. It's not about praying for victory or praying for healing. It's about praying out of victory. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.